What we're going to be talking about today is eating the elephant, managing the big Drupal project. Uh, first thing to do is just explain, uh, first of all, those of you who just had lunch, this is always the toughest slot, the last day. Okay, is that better? Can you hear me at the back? And th anybody at the back or up the top who wants me to stand up, I already am, okay? So, um, <laughs> uh, <coughs> so <laughs> this is always the toughest slot. It's the last day. It's just after lunch. Everybody's ready to have a little snooze. That's fine. It's been a long week for everybody. And uh, just enjoy the time. Um, it's called e Eating the Elephant, uh, but that's a metaphor. There are no elephants in this presentation. Uh, no elephants were harmed in the making of this presentation. And uh, just a quick introduction. My name's Colin Sweetman, uh, and this is Al Croston from Access 12. And uh, this is not a technical presentation. Uh, so those of you that are here because you want to find out about build the technical building of big Drupal sites, this is not a presentation for you. This is about the project management and stakeholder management for big Drupal projects. So just so we got that clear up front. So if you think this isn't for you, that's absolutely fine. We can't understand. But I just wanted to be clear about that up front. Okay, what we'll cover. Um, the approach is this, this, this is kind of a this is not a specific case study, it's an amalgamation of lessons that we've learned on big Drupal projects. Um, we're not here to teach you stuff. We're just trying to share some of our experiences and some of the lessons that we've learned. And uh, uh, just so that you can maybe take away some of the things we've learned, it might be useful for you. And everybody's projects and everybody's organizations are different. You need to adapt and uh, there's, no, there's no one size fits all approach. But so we're just sharing some of our experiences. So what we'll cover is scaling a Drupal team for an enterprise project, um, keeping agility, but providing a waterfall wrapper for the customer. And we'll go into that in quite a bit of detail. Uh, finding and keeping superstars. Uh, building team cohesion. So once you've built your team, trying to help that team work at its kind of top performance. And uh, something that we got some feedback from uh, a few months ago, we, we put up a blog post on our site and said, look, we're doing this session. Uh, let us know if there's anything you specifically want us to cover. And one of the things that we got some feedback about is how do you sell Drupal to nervous clients? So it's not exactly within the mainstream of this presentation, but people did ask for it. So we'll just share how we approach it. Okay, so I'll just pass you over to Al. He's going to set the scene. Thank you, Cole. So this is a pretty dry topic. So what we're going to try and do to put it into some context is set the scene. As Cole said, we've got um, a series of projects that we've amalgamated together to try and make this presentation work. So picture this. You're quietly sitting at your desk. You're in a senior role in a team. You might be on your fourth coffee for the morning, and your boss comes up and taps you on the shoulder and says, mate, I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to take on this piece of work. It's really going to be great, quite a bit of work, but it's going to be really something very special in the end. So what he starts with is, I'd like you to set up a team. And you're thinking, OK, so far, so good. Oh, and they're going to be all contractors. You start to think, OK, this is getting a little bit worrying. But on the stress levels, it's all OK. You then start to hear a bit more. He then says, I want you to develop a new website. It's going to support a huge community of users, 100,000. They're all going to be active, and it's going to have a whack of content. Lots of content. You start to think, OK, this is getting better. You then hear the good news that you need to audit and migrate 65,000 content items from existing sites. They're not Drupal sites in any way, shape, or form. Some of them are 10 years old. Some of them are really, really complicated stuff. You're starting to think now, OK, how can I get out of it? You then start to think, all right, it can't get much worse. You then hear that you've got nine months to do it. You do start to hear some good news in that you do have a budget that is pretty flexible. You'll be able to get the people you need to do the job, and you will have some pretty good control over it. But when you start to do the planning, think about the maths, think about how many days there are in a month, you very quickly realize you're going to need a big team, 100 odd people, probably internal, then with some huge suppliers to back you up. You also start to think that to try and use the most of time, Offshore is going to do you some favors. So the challenge has been set. You're already thinking, my god, on my stress, this is going through the roof. How am I really going to get out of this? 
What we did was tackle this one step at a time, or as the metaphor goes, one bite at a time. So, I said it. <laughs> On to goal and the project. Uh, yeah, so Al's got his stress levels up through the roof, so the first thing he'll do is uh, come and share that with me as his project manager. Um, and the first thing I have to do is start thinking about the project fundamentals and, you know, any of you that have run projects, the fundamentals are the fundamentals, which is the, the old classic uh, project triangle of um, the scope, the time scales, and the quality. And obviously, you've got that budgetary constraint within it. And uh, even though it's almost a cliche and it's a gross simplification, from a PM's perspective, it's really, really inter interesting and very important to just go back to those basic fundamentals and think about what that's going to mean about how you're going to get the balance right because you've got to get the balance right of an acceptable level of quality, not gold plate it necessarily, but it's clearly got to be an acceptable level of quality. Try not to build up too much technical debt because of the speed at which you're doing stuff. Uh, and also uh, get it out on time because we've got a set launch day. Um, so uh, I'll pass you back to him. Okay, we're going to try not to pass the baton all the time. So on to what we think is easily the most important factor of any big project is the people. Um, we've been lucky enough to work with some pretty amazing people. I can see a few of them here, so I had to say that really. No, but they, ha they really have been incredible. We've been really lucky to be able to use some incredible uh, connections within the community to get the best people. And as I'll say it again, they're easily the most important aspect. It doesn't really matter what you've got to do. If you've got the people who help you do it, there's a really good chance you'll get there. What we've also tried to do is always hire the best. Um, we've been fortunate in that our budgets have been pretty good. We've been able to recruit heavily, get some great people. But when you are trying to build a team from scratch, the size of 100 people, you've really got to think carefully about how you build that up. Our approach has been in the past to start with the senior people, get some senior people who have got some pretty good ideas about how to deliver, get those guys in on the ground, and get them involved in doing that recruitment. They want to choose the people that they want to work with. They want to be comfortable with them. They want to be confident in them. You want to get the best that they can out of everybody. Uh, what we've always done in the past is spend the time on recruitment. Sorry, there's a, a T under that hand. What that really means in, in general day-to-day -day work is you do spend a lot of time on recruitment. I think we spent probably the first few weeks, if not months, in interviews. I think on average we uh, saw 47 CVs or resumes for each individual candidate that actually made it into the team, which is a pretty incredible amount, but you do get quick at looking at people and looking for their expertise. And of course there's an experience that they can put on paper, but you really need to be able to work with them. So we would often get them in and have a bit of a chat about things, not a traditional interview in that sense, it was a bit of a discussion about how they thought these sorts of projects could be run, what they're interested in generally, how they see um, themselves working in the future, what they want to get into. What we also try to do is give our technical people code tests and we're really specific about the things that they needed to meet. And it was surprising the people that, particularly devs, who could really talk the talk, but when they got down to doing that real specific activity of code testing, they really struggled. Or vice versa, some, not surprising, couldn't talk, but were amazing at what they could do in terms of cutting code. What we also tried to do in that sort of sense of building everybody up was to make sure that everybody knew what their deliverable was. We made sure that from the team down, everybody knew what they were responsible for and the areas they weren't. You don't want a high-performing team standing on each other's toes. It gets really complicated to manage and everybody gets pretty upset. So it was very clear what people were responsible for and what they weren't. Okay. The, the key part of what we were trying to deliver relied on a team, not a group of individuals, a team. We spent a lot of time working on team cohesion, making sure that they were happy working together, again making sure that everybody knew what they were responsible for and weren't getting worried because they'd missed something. Everybody knew what their deliverables were, everybody knew what they were expected to do and when they were expected to do it. They worked hard at that. What we also tried to encourage was a bit of work hard, play hard. We had a monthly happy hour, which often ended in a few late nights, but was great because you got to know people outside of a work context. It wasn't quite mandatory, but it was pretty close. We've got a lot of people who enjoyed coming along. Some people, it just wasn't their cup of tea, which is fine. We just found that having a chance to sit down with people was really enjoyable to get to know people outside of that work sense. I think the key part 
of having such a high powerful, high powered team, sorry, is that you empower them to deliver. We encourage our senior leads to resolve those issues within their own teams or at that senior level and not look for a steer every time something came up. And they became very good at it, excellent at it actually. They were able to resolve any of those big issues that came up just by having a chat. They'd had that great set of experience so they could do that based on that experience and they were not worried about trying to do it. Some of the brainstorming sessions that happened after midnight on a Tuesday, Wednesday night were really incredible. Lots of great things came from that. What we tried to do was make sure that everybody knew who the, the management structure was. We wanted to sort of make sure that everybody knew who they could go and talk to, make sure that everybody knew that there was a structure in place. In the end, it got quite flat in a way. We had a group of people who would meet regularly with the senior management team, got to voice their concerns, ask questions about how things were going or not, and got to really see how to control what was going on, knew where we were aiming, and got to put their two cents in about how we'd get there. As we said right at the start, we, we had a big internal team, but we also needed a lot of internal, uh, sorry, external supplier help. And we engaged some companies in India to do that work for us. As I said, that gave us a great almost 24-hour delivery. We got to use the time difference, and they were able to help us in terms of that delivery. What we did do is made sure that our communication lines with them were excellent. We always made sure that they understood what we were trying to achieve and when we were trying to do it. We also made sure that they um, understood what context we were working in. They came and visited the office we had here in the UK. They came and sat with the team. They rotated in and around, made sure they understood who they were talking to. They had a face to the name when they were in a Skype session or having a chat over the phone. The thing you've got to do, though, with those companies is make it clear what sort of input you want from them. You set the standards early, you make sure they understand what a successful delivery means, what you expect in terms of timeliness and quality. I don't think there was any doubt that our standards were quite high, but our suppliers really rose to the challenge and were able to deliver for us. And I think we have benefited from what was some pretty crazy timescales in getting the work done. They were able to improve their processes at the same time we were improving ours. Okay, so you've got the delivery team right, Everything seems to be going pretty well in terms of the team itself, but don't forget the stakeholders. You've really got to show those stakeholders some love. The first thing we needed to do was to convince our stakeholders that Drupal was the CMS. And it, many of you that have gone through it will know that it is quite a complicated thing to do. Stakeholders often come from a historical background of IT projects being really horrific, very bad experiences of budgets being blown before anything really comes on board. So what we tried to do was pitch it along the lines of uh, Drupal being one of a handful of new, back then, open source products. And we compared those to the, what was available then, those COTS or commercially off the shelf products. And said that really what you've got to think about is how strong these open source products are already and how strong they're going to be in the market. A lot of the, the um, I guess the reasons we gave them, everybody here will know, I, I, you wouldn't be here if you didn't uh, believe in them yourself. In terms of Drupal, we really focused on the stability. Uh, it had been around for a long time, several versions in, and a huge amount of features, thousands and thousands of features. It's a bit hard for stakeholders to get that in context. So we spent some time showing them individual features and talking to them about what that would mean in terms of how you get delivery done quicker. Cole's going to talk to you a bit about Agile in a minute, but Agile and Drupal go very neatly together in terms of the stakeholder's mind. They can see how modules stick together, they can see how they fit in a sprint. At that stage, what we also started to talk to them about was who else was using Drupal. There's some really obvious ones, White House in the States. Data.gov here is a relatively recent one. They really started to get their head around that if those sorts of calibers of companies and organisations and governments are using Drupal, it must be safe. We, we also started to think about what else was being done within the UK. And lots of other companies within the UK were also starting to pick up Drupal. Um, government generally had started to look at it. Um, Captain Gemini's obviously got a big stand here. They've really helped the presence within the UK of using Drupal. Stakeholders generally are now getting their head around what it means to be able to use such a powerful tool. Then interestingly, I thought this might have been a, a bit of a nervous point for them, but the community aspect was a real selling point. Having tens of thousands of active users who were really active in promoting the product helped get their head around what a big community helps Drupal, drives it on, makes it happen. Okay, so we told them Drupal's the go, we sold them Drupal, they finally bought up to it, 
then we spent a lot of time making sure they trusted us. And we thought that was important so they would let us get on with things. We tried to build that trust by showing them. We wanted them to see how things were progressing. And you get that different level of interest. Some stakeholders want to see things, some don't really care. Some want to know how many problems there are, some want to know how much the budget has been used, how much uh, you've got to go in terms of time scale. What we focused on was showing them progress. And we would do it all the time and to anybody who was interested. Anybody who asked, we would show them. Some people were only interested in the design piece. Some people wanted to see how many servers were in a rack. Literally, we would show them whatever we could and as often as we could. What we also tried to do was make sure that we had a really strong reporting structure over the top of our delivery. And Cole will talk a bit about this again. Um, we made sure that there were traditional reports that were available to the stakeholders. We made sure that they had the things that they are used to seeing. Risk reports, for example. Red, amber, green. Where are the problem areas? What are we worried about? What do we think we're doing in terms of progress? We're up in this area, but down in that. Why is that? And I think we ended up reporting on a weekly basis in some detail, which is a bit of an overhead, but we got really uh, a good response from our stakeholders, and they were able to trust us to get on with it. You hear some horror stories about stakeholders being so hands-on and really grinding a project to a halt because they can't get their head around what's being delivered and don't really trust what's going on. We got, in some ways, quite fortunate that our stakeholders were able to let us get on with it. Okay, yeah, so uh, we talked a little bit about the project fundamentals a few slides back, and I was just been talking about the people both internally within the project team and also on the stakeholder side of things. Uh, so now we're going to cover some of the slightly less glamorous but very important uh, processes around running a project like that. Um, this isn't going to be a project management seminar. It's just an overview, and it's just those lessons that we learn. So the classic... The classic uh, comparison you're always going to have about how you're going to deliver any kind of uh, technology project is Agile versus Waterfall. I would think that most people here would say that uh, Waterfall is great for building things like bridges, where you know what type of bridge it's going to be, how big a gap you've got to get across, what materials you're going to use, how much weight does it have to carry. You know everything up front. Waterfall's fine for that. It's really good. Uh, but it's not so good for uh, technology projects, uh, particularly web projects, where the business requirements emerge over time as you're working on the project. And, uh, and Agile is great for that kind of stuff, technology projects. However, um, big projects, the projects of the size that we're talking about, by the very nature, because there's so much money involved and they're so high profile, will always be funded and governed in a kind of waterfall, very structured world. So the challenge that we've got uh, in the business is how can we deliver our projects as agile projects, but put that kind of waterfall wrapper around them. So what I call is kind of tactical agile, so the kind of day-to-day, week-by-week internal team approach. We try and do it in an agile way. Uh, but particularly the PM's role is to try and apply a waterfall wrapper around it, which, uh, which goes out to the governance model and the stakeholders, so that they, it's related to that trust and confidence thing. The more trust and confidence that you can build in them, the more freedom they will give you, and you know that you need a lot of freedom as a project team to be able to run Agile really well, because uh, you have to be able to flex and adjust and adapt, uh, inspect and adapt. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick word on evangelism, because I know that project management methodologies and uh, it can get people can get quite emotional about it. So, so can, can I just ask: Is there anybody here who's a Prince Two practitioner or is Prince Two qualified? Uh, yeah, so there's a few hands up there. Any certified scrum professionals out there? Yeah, a few more hands out there. So uh, it's all good stuff, but my personal opinion, my advice to you is if you're a PM or if, you're, uh, if you're, you have to deliver a project and you're, you're thinking about methodologies, just use what works. Try and do agile within the team. Prince Two Star re reporting and governance support outside the team. Don't get hung up on methodologies. Guys in this room, there may be one or two exceptions, but we're not actually paid to evangelize Agile or Scrum or Kanban. We're paid to deliver great websites. And methodologies are just tools in our toolbox. And just use the tools that work and uh, adjust them and adapt them. It doesn't matter 
if what you're doing is slightly different to the way Ken Schwaber tells you you should do Scrum. It doesn't matter, because Ken Schwaber is not the guy who's going to get fired if your project doesn't get delivered. So just use what works. The job of the PM in a situation like this, in my view, is very different from a traditional PM role, which is much more about controlling, monitoring, kind of being on top of things all the time. In my view, it's more about um, support for the team uh, and support for the stakeholders. So it, that's in terms of providing that visibility, the reports, the really good quality business intelligence about how the project is going uh, so that they feel completely in control, so that you also uh, have got information to the right people as far in advance as possible so they can make the right decisions about steering the project around. So that's where you get into things like managing your risk portfolio, really trying to look ahead of time about what roadblocks are coming up. And also on a more day-to-day -day basis within the team, my view is, certainly on these projects, my role was very much less of a PM and almost kind of like, a, kind of like an agony auntie almost in some respects. My job was to help the team right down to individual levels, help them get their blockers out of the way, just look around and slightly kind of adjust and nudge things back on track not step in with great big boots and stop people doing things. The aim was to give the teams and the individuals within the teams as much freedom as possible for them to do what they're good at. We, as Al said earlier on, we put a lot of effort into picking superstars. If you've got really good people, you have to trust them and you have to give them as much freedom as possible to really shine. So, so within the team, um, we ended up working mainly using 10-day sprints. We tried five-day sprints, up to 20-day sprints. And for us, for that project, 10-day sprints worked best. And uh, kind of a kind of typical kind of scrum thing. But it, it was actually, in some areas, it was starting to evolve into Kanban. We were doing some Kanban stuff, uh, which is kind of a slight flavor on the kind of standard sprint model where you, you measure how much capacity to go into the sprint. Um, uh, and that was driven by team members themselves. They came back to me and said, actually, you know, we've been thinking about this, and some of us have been away, and we've gone away and done some reading, we've done some studying about Kanban, and we think what we're doing will work better if we do it Kanban style. So I said, yeah, sure, okay, let's try it. You know, classic agile, inspect and adapt, you know. We had cross-functional scrum teams, so you'd have your uh, BAs, your devs, your testers, uh, you'd also have uh, DevOps support, You'd have uh, architects, solution architects, technical architects, designers, UX guys, all working together. In some cases, uh, they were l less embedded than others. Obviously, people like BAs and devs and testers were really closely coupled in their cross-functional teams, and very deeply embedded in those cross-functional teams. Whereas maybe the DevOps guys, the sysadmins and the systems engineers uh, would, would just have a fairly light touch across those cross-functional teams. Uh, outside the team, uh, I, my responsibility as the PM was to make sure that outside the team, the people that needed it, the decision makers, the blokes and ladies with the checkbooks, had their highlight reports, the traditional kind of highlight reports. They got a r good risk management and great visibility of risks that were coming up so that they could make business decisions well in advance, which obviously helped us as a team about how we mitigate those risks. And obviously, change control, so, which is just a bit tricky where you're trying to deliver Agile because you know change is built in, that's why you're doing it as Agile. But where change started to get really big or potentially really big about changes to what was required in the backlog, we would have a mechanism so that we could stop the stakeholders from going totally crazy and saying, actually, you know, uh, we know we wanted a portal site, but now we've decided we want to do an auction site. You know, something that big or really big changes to the components of the site. We would have kind of threshold so that it would have to go into more formal change control. So that that way we mitigated a lot of kind of feature massive scope creep. But all of that waterfally wrapper, my part of my job was to shield that from the team as much as possible. To, because they need to be able to work in an agile way, not get hung up in all that kind of stuff. And Al will talk about some of the tools and communications tools and stuff like that that we use to try and help that happen. Uh, uh, so I didn't have to go around micromanaging people and asking individuals and, and senior devs and, 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 and uh, uh, some of the leadership guys uh, uh, on the delivery teams for status reports, 
they naturally did their burn down charts, we knew what our bug backlog was, all that stuff was being delivered anyway just as part of their day to day thing and that day to day work and I could just, uh, I could just uh, look at those reports and consolidate them without bothering people so they could carry on cutting code and delivering great functionality. So we had a product backlog and on a big, big project like this, the way, the way we worked is we sliced it up into what we called components and then within a component, increments. So a component would be a, a massive thing like search, but within, uh, within a big component like search, you might have an increment which is to deliver one particular part of faceting. Uh, we'd only work down to the detail level as stuff got closer in the backlog in terms of time. Uh, there's no point over-engineering it and doing loads of really detailed user stories for things that you're not going to be delivering for six months. Because there's a good chance that the business requirements will have changed and all that work will have been wasted anyway because you'll have to do it again. So the stuff that was the highest priority stuff was the stuff that we defined in the most detail. So that it was defined, and actually we got pretty good at it, at defining it and getting uh, the user stories and all of the acceptance criteria nailed just before it went into, it was ready to go into the full sprint. Uh, and that worked really quite well. Um, broken down, obviously, uh, product owners, normally you typically have a product owner for an Agile project. Something this big, it's absolutely impossible to have a single product owner because no individual could get their head around the scope of it and, and have the level of engagement that you'd need. Also, because of the waterfall way that the stakeholders wanted to work with us, they didn't want to get involved on a day-to-day -day basis in the way that you really need a product owner to get involved. So what we did was, we agreed with them that some of our senior management team from within the project team would be specialized area product owners. So there would be a technical product owner, there would be a user experience product owner, there would be a content product owner, for example, those big broad areas. And there were some very senior guys within the project team and we got a formal mandate, a sign off from the stakeholders that they had the ability to make the kind of more day-to-day -day changes that you want from a product owner so that the product owners could get involved with the cross-functional teams, the devs could come and say, or could come and talk to a product owner and say, look, you know you said you wanted this pink? Well, it's gonna take us three days longer to do it pink. Are you happy if it's red? And they had the, those area product owners had the power to be able to say, yeah, that's fine, just do it that way. The really big change is if we thought, mm, that's gonna be really tricky, it's a big change, then we'd push it up, it would go outside the team in the formal reporting that we talked about earlier on, and then again, that's something that the stakeholders would make the big decisions on. But all the, the, the more minor ones, the ones that can really slow a project down, uh, we got the sign off to be able to make those changes because we had really experienced, high-performing senior management people in the project team, and the stakeholders had enough trust to get, let us get on with it. So building the trust up with the stakeholders is really, really important if you want to deliver a big project quickly. And they acted, as I said, they acted as proxies for the stakeholders. So they, they were the guys, they were in our team, so it was great, we had fantastic comms, we could talk to them all day long, in day, day in, day out. You know, a, a, a UX guy could talk to them about something. The user testing guys that we had could talk to them about things. Our front end devs could say, you know, you said you wanted this kind of JavaScript thing to look like this, well, you know, it's kind of going to be a bit tricky, can we do it like that? And they can just make a decision on the spot, so it's great. Okay, so uh, as well as the kind of project management processes, we also had a big range of standards uh, that we had to think about up front uh, to put in place across a whole range of things uh, which are wrapped around the project and wrapped around making sure that the quality of the finished product is good enough. So things like uh, accessibility standards, other non-functional requirements like security, performance, load, um, uh, coding, Drupal coding standards, all those kind of things. We have to make sure, think up front about having those well documented or well available on, online on our own team intranet, which we built using Open Atrium, of course. Um, and uh, when you've got 100 people and you've got new devs starting almost every week, you have to make sure that that information is easy to hand so they can learn really quickly about what the standards are to work to. 
a whole bunch of stuff we had to do about testing, massive amount of work we did on testing, both automated and manual testing. We learned a lot of lessons about the amount of work there is in setting up continuous integration environments for big projects like this. I'm not going to go into technical details. I'm not a technical guy, but uh, we learned some big lessons about that. A couple of people smiling because they've heard me say that about a thousand times. Um, usability, user testing was a huge big deal. We got a great mandate from clients to be able to go out and do loads and loads of user testing. If you can get clients to let you do it and show them the value of it, it pays massive dividends. I'm sure most of you know that anyway. And uh, user, test, user, user testing, we spent a lot of time on usability and user testing. Uh, because you can build a great functional website, but you may miss the target because it doesn't actually work the way your demographic wants it to work. Release management, load of stuff on that, the way we did code submission, you know, the branching and all that kind of stuff, and then config management, which obviously, on a big site like this, where you've got like uh, very big environments, uh, a, big, a big kind of infrastructure footprint, uh, the config management side of things is really quite important to make sure that worked well. Uh, so we, we used Puppet for that. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go into details about that one either. So, uh, that's about it on the processes and around the, the supporting activity and the operational readiness type stuff that we did around there. And I'll push it back over to Wayne. Thank you. So, I counted Cole, only five walked out then. Yep, I won the bet. Yeah. We thought processes would be really tough after lunch. We'd lose a few people. We only five, oh, no, six. <laughs> Couldn't handle it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, We've talked a lot about the people, the stakeholders, managing those relationships with the suppliers. Cole's talked a lot about processes which are crucial, deathly boring, but crucial. The other thing that we think is hugely important is operations. First thing I'm going to talk to you about is uh, accommodation. And this is really basic stuff, but on a big project with a limited time, it's really important. Where you can, open plan office. We found that in our open plan office, it was a lot easier for people to communicate. You didn't have to guess if somebody was in their meeting room, in their office, to go and have a talk to them. You just looked up, and there they were. You'd wander over and have a chat. But it's a, a really important piece to think about how often people are going to be sitting at that desk, possibly on weekends, possibly long time. Make it open plan. Make it bright, comfortable. I don't think I'd want to sit for a long time in an uncomfortable position or in a dark room. The other thing we tried to do, and this had some positives and some negatives, is seat teams together. Um, some of our senior team wanted to try and mix that up a bit, so we might have the, the front end devs sitting with the designers, for example, but we had some big teams, particularly around content, for example, that needed to be sitting together. So that as editorial standards changed, they could easily talk about it. They knew that everybody was on the same page and applying the same things uh, the same way. We also had a few interesting discussions and moved people around quite a bit within management. It's a real conundrum, I think. You can find that if you're within your team um, and you can hear what's going on, you can easily sort out any issues and answer questions really quickly. On the flip side, people are often concerned about voicing their ideas if the management are there. So we, d we ended up with a mix. We ended up letting the senior lead or the team lead choose whether they sat there. And it was different for some people. Some people for the development, for example, just wanted the devs to get on with it. They knew what they were doing. They had a, a really detailed spec in front of them that they could work to. It wasn't as like there was as many questions to answer or ask about. Solutions architecture, different story. Needed to talk amongst themselves, get a steer from our senior technical lead, make sure that they were following the plan. What we also made sure, and we were pretty lucky in that we got to choose um, what sort of accommodation we had. We were able to leave some space for breakout areas. And wherever we could, we stuck whiteboards on the wall. We even had some whiteboards on wheels that just literally moved around the office. It's amazing what happens when there's a whiteboard there. Somebody will draw on it, get some ideas. Those ideas are easier to convey, particularly for people, and I'll pick on devs again, who are not great at communicating. Drawing the picture makes it a lot easier for people to understand. A visual representation really helps. What, as Cole said, we also had Agile which meant that there were some very enthusiastic planning sessions. Lots of yelling and carrying on, which is great and really helps camaraderie within a team, but not so good if you're trying to sort out how you install Module X so it works with Module Y. So we got lots of meeting rooms and encouraged people to use their, their space for those meeting rooms and keep the, sorry, for those meetings and keep the discussions going and not worry about how loud or boisterous they are. Okay, communications. And again, another crucial aspect. I seem to be saying that a lot. 
But if you think about what can happen with a high-performing team, if they go down the wrong path because they didn't understand what was told to them or what was said to them, they get very quickly down that wrong path. You want to make sure that they are very clear communication about what's going on, what's expected. If the plan changes, make sure everybody knows that that plan's changed. Make sure that everybody knows what's expected of them. And keep the communications informal, but also formal. We had weekly meetings, we had some senior management meetings where uh, the senior managers were expected to go out and pass the information back on. They did that in an informal way. A lot of people preferred just a coffee with their guys, have a chat. We also had daily stand-ups and daily scrum of scrums. Really short sessions, but it was mandatory to attend and it made sure that everybody was on the same page. If there was a problem that team A hadn't sorted out a blocker for team B, it became very obvious that that needed to happen really quickly. Big blockers got tackled really quickly. Talked a bit about meetings already. We, I think we struggled a bit with meetings actually in the end. We had a lot of meetings. We had a lot of different discussions going on that sort of turned into weekly meetings. We tried to make sure that everybody knew what was going on. It often felt like a one-way conversation. People were really taking that away. So what we ended up with was some short meetings and a few of them, probably several a week but we made sure they were short and important. If they weren't valuable, it was a waste of time, therefore money. What we really tried to do without punching each other up was to be open and honest. If there was some discussion about ideas and whether that idea was good or not, it was encouraged that you'd be uh, quite open about whether you thought that was a good idea or not, and if not, why not? And often, if not, what's your idea and replacement? Come up with some suggestions. Keep the communication open. I can't remember too many punch-ups. There might have been one or two, but we got things going and it really improved communication. You knew that you were going to get an honest answer to any suggestion you had. You knew that you were going to have a good conversation about ideas and they really helped form solutions in a really quick way. So, use communication systems. We've got IAM and Twitter and a phone, FAQ style and email. We use lots of them. Um, Cole talked about intranet site. We've also uh, used Jabber for IM. We had Skype, lots of phone calls. Particularly important when you're using, uh, working with offshore teams to keep that communication open. We also use things like TeamViewer for people to see and share each other's uh, screens. Just, again, visual so you can see what's going on instead of listen to what that person's told you. And, as we've said, just keep the information going. Keep sharing, make sure everybody knows make sure it's there for everybody. We didn't have secure areas on the internet that people couldn't get to. Everything was open. Everybody could see um, what other teams were up to. Everybody was able to go and talk to anybody if they wanted to know no more about what they were doing. But what it boils down to, it's all about the water cooler. If you're there, you want to know something, catch the person in the kitchen, have a chat to them, just generally discuss, general discussion. Turn up to their desk, have a chat about what you're worried about or thought about or any of those issues, you'll quickly resolve any problems. Okay, IT operations. So IT toolkit, it's again obvious, but to a technical team it's crucial. We made sure that we had the kit for the role, and by that I mean we had designers that had two monitors and a fast machine. We had devs that had two monitors. We didn't ever expect a dev to try and cut code on a little laptop. If they wanted to, okay. But we tried to encourage them to use the best that we could. The other crucial point is to make support as easy as possible. You'll quickly burn money and effort if the support piece for managing all of that kit, and it's a lot of kit for 100 people, takes five, six people to manage. We made sure that the images that were set up were easily reusable, that we made sure we're on top of patches, we made sure that we used everything we could in terms of the latest infrastructure. And we controlled it. I think this is a really important piece. In something as big as what we're talking about here, it wasn't unusual to have 26, 27 individual boxes in terms of the site infrastructure. All sorts of environments across those uh, individual boxes. Having to ask somebody to change something in there is going to grind things to a halt. So it was key to us to control it. We didn't really get on very well with the overall IT team, but we eventually showed them that our way was the way and got to control what we were using and made sure that changes happened when were they were required and made sure that we were able to speed things up. Another obvious one, connections to the team and from the team must be as quick as possible. Nothing breaks a coder's spirit than having to watch the hourglass tick over. 
They really, really hate it. Again, another obvious one. Current versions of software should be used. There's a reason they're there. We've got to make the most of them. Um, and again, open source. We found in the end that I think we even went away from Outlook as the, the only proprietary system. So there are plenty of open source products out there to do all that you need. We found that everything that we wanted from an, a, a software product was available in open source. We found that most of the time they were better. Okay, so you've done all the hard work, all the work's been done, all the development's been done, all the testing's been done, you're now starting to think about how to get this thing live, which is not as easy as it sounds in a site like this. What we concentrated on, along with that testing and the development, is operational readiness, which is not just a, are we ready with the server, it's is the MNC team ready, are the sales team ready, is the help desk ready, have we done everything we need to around informing our users, are the stakeholders signed off? In the end, it was less about technology in the end. It was more about is everybody comfortable that the site is what they expect it to do? Sure, there were some things that we needed to resolve, but are they critical to the launch? We really pushed hard with stakeholders to make sure that they were happy and had done a formal signature on a piece of paper sign off. Uh, and we spent a, quite a bit of time with our hosting provider. We wanted to make sure that they understood that having to scale up the site really quickly because the user base had jumped through the roof was a, a good problem. Be prepared for it. Make sure that we've got the right kit in place. Make sure that we are using the cloud. Get ready for it. it was, we told them it was going to happen. They were prepared. They worked hard to make sure they were ready and available. And then when we did launch, we tried to make it as easy as possible. We have learned that doing it at 3 a.m. after a full week of testing and development and bug fixing is not the best way to go. We tried to give ourselves a bit of time, do it perhaps early in the morning, perhaps a beta launch, make it as easy as possible and on a full night's sleep. Okay. Okay, so you'll all be delighted to know that we're coming to the end. Um, so quick recap, so what we covered, we talked about the fundamental of the project triangle, um, we uh, had Al talking about the human factors, as I call it, uh, of, of the internal team, getting the right people, making sure you keep them, make them top performing teams, and also managing stakeholder expectations and building that confidence and trust. Um, we talked about the processes on delivery and support. Um, and uh, we looked at aspects of operations around accommodation, communications, IT toolkit, et cetera. And then Al's just outlined some of the key factors to think about when you're getting ready to go live. So that's what we covered. Uh, thank you very much for staying with us and being so patient. Uh, and thank you for not throwing any tomatoes at us. And if anybody's got any questions, I think we've got a few minutes to take some questions. Hi, Maxim from Ajax. Um, well, uh, basically, you didn't talk about one thing. I, th I think it's really important for, for everybody's estimation. When the client arrives and with a big project and <laughs> says, okay, uh, I have this, when it will be done, how much it costs? And yeah. once you said, uh, you cannot be changed, <laughs> or very difficultly. So what is your you know, rocket science technique to estimate <laughs> projects? Well, it's, uh, some of these projects like this, what, one, one of the things you do know up front is you do know kind of an outline of the budget. So what you can do from that is you can make, a, you make a kind of an educated guess at the kind of percentages of different roles that you're going to need. You know, you're going to need X percent of the people on your team are going to be BAs, Y percent are going to be devs or senior devs, and you're going to need a certain percentage of senior devs to lead those and guide those teams. From that and from what you know is the... The, 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 the current market cost of those people per day, you can start to estimate how big is the bucket of capacity that you've got to fill that, to fill that uh, budget and build some contingency in. From that bucket of capacity, you can start to estimate very broadly, not exactly as uh, down to story point level, but you can start to kind of t-shirt size uh, what you could do in terms of the components that they've, uh, the clients have asked for in the scope of the project. And 
basically that's the first, you're starting to get the first view of the project backlog then. Because, the, because you're starting to see the prioritised backlog list, you've done some t-shirt sizing, you know how many people it's going to need to deliver those things. And basically your capacity list, your, your, your bucket of capacity will have a, eventually down, will have the equivalent of a red line somewhere down that product backlog. And that's what you can do with the budget. That's how you can estimate how much of the scope can be delivered. And that's the first thing you'd start to feed back to the clients to say, based on the budget you provided and the estimates we've done on the skill sets and numbers of people that we need to do this project at this scale, this is how much of your desired functionality you will get. Is this still the priority that you want things delivered in? Because that red line doesn't move unless you give us more money. And then we're saying what we found is they would then, just above that red line, start to shift things around. Pull something from below the line which currently wasn't being done and move it up. So that list got shifted around and they could really focus on what they wanted then. Thank you. Chop down there in the blue t-shirt. I thought you were going to say Drupal t-shirt then. There's a few of them here. I had two questions. Uh, one, uh, you mentioned that you've got roughly 100 people in your team or whatever. I was really kind of curious to figure out what the, uh, the breakdown of the different roles and responsibilities of that team was. Um, and I'm also kind of curious, once you actually built up a team of 100 people, what did you do with them at the end? That's a good question. Should I do that one? So I think of the 100 people we had, uh, and Steve's here, he'll nod, it, what, about 25 content people, 30 people for content. Oh, okay, sorry, not quite right. And, uh, roughly about the same size for uh, dev, obviously a little bit smaller, but dev in, in our world included front-end devs, um, sysads, a uh, mixture of DevOps too. Uh, then we had a small solutions architecture team four or five, I think, who steered the overall technical direction of the project. Um, we had uh, a UX team, which handled uh, user uh, testing, visual design, um, uh, wireframing. Um, we had, who are we missing, a BA team, who um, ended up being a sort of a mini scrum master, if you like, but also doing the, the work on producing the detail, as Cole talked about, for the product, um, the product backlog and test. So we had tests that also worked closely with the development team. So I think it was, and Steve was right, we ended up with a big content team. We ended up with uh, a content team being the main, so let's say 45 for them, 20 dev, and then the rest were broken down in that gap and roughly about the same. Uh, in terms of the team, um, we, we worked together for quite a few years and then in the end, the team got disbanded. So the team, some of these people are here. Um, Access 12 has been formed on the basis of some of those people, uh, but the rest are out there, and I'm sure if they put their hand up, they'll be available to have a chat to anybody who wants to try and recruit them. And that, just to add something onto there, that's one of the reasons why, clearly, when this team was formed, we had to go to contractors, to end up to freelancers, um, because if you're building a big team like that, a permanent team, there are massive HR overheads in doing it, and also, it takes a very long time to build up a team of permanent staff that fast. So there are cost implications. Obviously, you always pay more for contract staff, but uh, in terms of the speed at which you can build the team up and minimizing the, the HR overhead, it's really the only way to go on a project like that. Just to follow up, how, of those 20-odd technical people, how many of them actually had significant Drupal experience? Uh, Dave, I think most of them, didn't they? For, for those that didn't hear, um, Dave, who led our technical effort, was um, saying that we, we ended up using as much people or resources as we could through the Drupal community uh, and then going to people that had PHP experience to try and beef up their skills. And we, we found that worked quite well, actually, in the main. We, we got good at trying to, um, as Cole said, set the standards to start, give them some training in Drupal, and PHP dev is, is pretty quick in Drupal in the end. Okay. Any, more? Any more questions? Chat there down on the eye. So you mentioned you uh, outsourced um, a portion of your development to India. Uh, how did you vouch for uh, the variable code quality from individual developers and suppliers as a whole in India and also the different sort of design ideologies? 
that you have out there compared with, say, the UK or the US? Well, <laughs> that's broadly speaking, the reason that that worked okay because they weren't, we didn't just farm a whole chunk of work out to India and then they go off and work in a kind of a, a, a kind of a vacuum, an information vacuum. That, that offshore resource was integrated into our teams. So they would be working virtually with our UK devs every day and our development manager would be speaking to them and running stand-ups with them and with UK devs every day. So there wasn't really that kind of separation. And because they were working very closely on a day-to-day on -day basis, there was a level of visibility and a level of kind of uh, organizational and cultural alignment with the rest of the team. So there wasn't really a significant risk of that happening. Having, ex having said that, there was, you know, th there are there are challenges in working with an offshore team uh, in terms of y the communications can be quite tricky at times, especially when you're working using kind of you're, you're working virtually. You have to uh, sometimes be very clear about what you're communicating and the way you're communicating it. Uh, there's an overhead in that, but generally speaking, it, it actually worked quite well, and and, and certainly it, it's I think it's a really valid way of doing it, and the quality of the the work that we got from the guys that we had offshore was very, very good. Uh, chap up there. Sorry. Sorry, mate. Hi. Um, having moved from .NET development into open source, I've found um, getting a consistency of tool sets uh, quite difficult for big teams. Did you mandate a tool set for the developers that you brought on board, and if so, what was it? Uh, yeah, we did mandate. We had a, an image that we came pre-installed on a developer's machine. Um, it was quite flexible in the end, though. There were some specifics that they needed to um, comply with, um, the details of which uh, I'm probably not best placed to tell you, but there are a couple of guys here that will be able to give you the details of that after the session. Um, we tried to make it clear that there were some things like code submission that had to go through subversion, for example. There were some things you just had to do. We also tried to, without being uh, too over the top about it, monitor what people were up to in terms of how, what they were installing on their systems. We didn't want um, a virus, for example, coming into the system to bring the whole lot down. It was important that people were aware of that. And in the main, people were okay with that. Okay, any more? Or is the torture over? Okay, great. I think we're do done. Thank you very much for staying such a long time. Really appreciate it. It's just tough to it. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, if anybody's got any specific questions you want to ask anything or make us feel even more stupid, we're up on booth three for the next couple of hours. By all means, come and have a chat with us. We'd really like to talk to you. All right, cheers. Bye. Oh, I just, just as you're going, because I'll get told off by uh, the Drupal Association if I don't do this. Please locate this session and uh, take the survey because the feedback that they get on the sessions is really important and it helps them to design better DrupalCons moving forward, okay? So you can be brutally honest on there, okay? You don't have to tell me to my face because I'll just cry. All right, thanks.